Hi, this is Daniel and you're watching Unrivaled Investing, a no hype channel focused on trying to find you exceptional companies and unrivaled investments. That's why it's called Unrivaled Investing. That's the name of the channel. Today, we're going to focus on Live Oak Acquisition Corp. The ticker is L-O-A-K. That's the ticker for now. They're merging with, merging with a company called Danimer. You'll learn more about that later. So this is what is Live Oak Acquisition Corp? What is Danimer? What's their business model? Because Danimer is going to be driving the value of this company going forward. Um, what's their opportunity? Does this have 10x potential? I'm looking not for small movements. I'm looking for things that I could own for years or even decades at a time that ideally have hundreds of percent upside over time. So you need to have that type of 10x potential in order to get those types of crazy returns. Uh, does this have, does Danimer have an unrivaled value proposition or a UVP? We'll get into that and what that means in a minute. And thoughts on the transaction, the merger, and then a free investment calculator for the loyal YouTube subscribers that get to the end of this video. But before digging in, if you're interested in learning about potential multi-baggers, you know, the types of companies that can go up hundreds or even thousands of percent, make sure you're a subscriber to this channel now. If you're already a subscriber, I appreciate the like on the videos. Also, if you want to know what I'm personally doing in my own personal investment portfolio, go to unrivaledinvesting.com, click on journey. You get to see what I'm buying, selling, holding each month, you know, with exclusive content, ideally aiming to generate exclusive content each week just for journey subscribers. And let me let it's it's worthwhile to point out those loyal journey subscribers, they voted this past week on what they wanted the next video to be about. And this is it. This is what most votes got. They wanted to learn more about Live Oak, my thoughts on the potential from here. And that's why I'm making this this video goes out to you, all the loyal journey subscribers, particularly Ivan and I think PZ Experience. I think that was uh, that was your name. So also if you have a question or you enjoy watching these videos, feel free to leave a comment below about, hey, this is the next company I'd like I'd like you to take a look at. It. At the very least, it gets added to the list. However, Journey subscribers do get the first vote. So what is Live Oak Acquisition Corp? It's a SPAC. A SPAC, you know, I'm going to do this super short. A SPAC is a pile of cash, effectively a holding company of cash, just looking for a company to merge with. The, the people that run that company get a good cut of whatever future company they merge with. So they're incentivized to find a deal. Effectively, it's getting a free piece of pie, if uh, potentially worth tens of millions of dollars, if they find a company to merge with. And so it's this pile of cash looking for a company to merge with. Um, that's the, the super short summary of what a SPAC is. Generally, I think there's a lot of misconceptions about SPACs. You know, I've, I've heard from a couple of Journey subscribers like, hey, I talked to my investment advisor, you know, what's, what, what, what their thoughts are on SPACs. And first of all, most investment advisors have no business being investment advisors. They're in the business of sales. They've never actually analyzed or done a breakdown of a stock before. They take research that's given to them and then they spit that back to you. Just something to think about. Um, and, he, you know, the, the misconception about SPAC um, there's, there's a lot of them. And you know what? I, I want to focus here on Live Oak. So I will make an exclusive video for Journey subscribers later this week about what are SPACs, why are there a lot of misconceptions, the pros and cons, um, going into a lot more detail on what are SPACs. Um, I've, I've done sort of high level in some of the prior SPAC uh, videos that I've done. You see Open Door, Clover, Desktop Metal, Multiplan. Um, so you, you could, there's a bunch of other companies that you can check out. But Let's let's look at Live Oak Acquisition Corp. Once again, the ticker is L-O-A-K. They're merging with Danimer. What's the company that they're merging with? What's the value here? And Danimer Scientific is a company pioneering, these are my own words, pioneering biodegradable solutions for consumer packaging and consumption products. And so you can see like Mr. Turtle over here, he's got you know some so a six pack uh, plastic wrapped around his neck, looks very uncomfortable. You got a beach covered in plastic bottles. And that's like, oh, what an eyesore. The problem there actually isn't the plastic bottles, it's the people, but never the, the never mind that. Um, okay, so what, what's actually the problem that you're, you're trying to solve? Um, the problem is actually plastics, where plastics are one, they're not sustainable. Plastics are generally made 
from non-renewable -re sources like oil, um, and they just fill up landfill over time. They they don't degrade over time. That's the problem. See, they they hurt the environment. Is that you know if you get random piece of plastic going in the ocean, you do get those turtles. Are like, oh. um, so what would be great is if you have plastic solutions um, that are 100% renewable. So you 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 can keep making them in the future without any problems versus using up a finite resource like oil. Uh, and ideally it breaks down in nature so that way there's no problem. And you can see there are multiple levels of, of measuring how things degrade. There's industrial comp um, compostable, um, compositable, where you take it to an industrial facility, they heat it up and it, it melts down. And you can see that the, the highest ranking is marine degradable where it just sort of breaks down in nature on its own so you don't have the the turtles choking themselves um so so the solution is to have these biopolymers that are bio you know meaning biological um you know whether or not it's from corn or flowers or oil that have varying degrees of biodegradability so how easily can this these products that we're using for packaging let's say a bottle of water how easily can that bottle sort of merge back with nature with causing without without causing harm. Um, so what's what's Danimer's solution to this? And their solution is PHAs, it's polyhydroxy alkanoates. I'm not gonna say it again. So PHAs, um, this is the direction where Danimer is heading. Um, their, their main business actually isn't this right now, um, but this is where they're heading, where the majority of their revenues will aims to be in the future, where it starts with this, this chemical compound, which is like a plastic substitute, and they're going to brand it under the Nodax brand, which is PHA. It's 100% renewable, and their, their goal is to use canola oil to create 100% biodegradable and compositable uh, biopolymers, um, where you know they, they can make it from this canola oil, and within 12 to 18 weeks, boom, after it's been discarded, it's fully degraded, which is great. You know, you don't have things filling up landfills or choking out animals. And potentially, as a plastic substitute, you can see this used in a myriad of, of applications, whether or not it's plastic bags or straws, plasticware cups, um, utensils. So this, is, this could have dramatic um, repercussions because right now, all those items, like all those water bottles that people are drinking from, most of them, like something like 80%, end up in landfills. And that's not a long-term solution that's sustainable. You want to find sustainable solutions so that way we can keep on going. Um, okay, so this this all sounds great, but is anyone actually interested in buying this? And absolutely they are. You have companies like PepsiCo, WinCup, Nestle that are all looking to work with Denim or saying, hey, we hear you have the hot tech for recycling and for creating these biodegradable solutions, these green solutions, we recognize we're one of the contributors to the problem because we're the one manufacturing these goods. You know, whether or not it's getting a bag of potato chips or a cup of water or a straw, um, how can we get something where it's better for the environment? And so you can see PepsiCo, they've taken a 6% ownership in Danimer. They're looking to have better plastic bags or better, you know, chip bags for, for people that you know, degrade over time in the environment after it's been used, not before. Um, you know, wind cup with their straws. A lot of people were complaining about sort of the paper straws and how they're disintegrating. You know, hey, can you have a plastic equivalent straw that after its use, it degrades over time, you know, a, a couple of weeks time. And same thing with water bottles. And you can see here it is, Nestle's, Nestle is working on, you know, they create a six-year R&D agreement to develop PHA for Nestle's Pure Life water business. So these are What's, what's important to think about each of these things is, is Danimer is creating multi-year, potentially multi-decade relationships with some of the largest consumer goods brands. So they are, they're sort of driving an industry here, trying to figure out, hey, let's make sure we're building something that they can actually use. And let's figure out, we're going to figure out the tech and you're going to tell us what you need. And, you know, you can hear, you know, they have some quotes from Danimer customers. PHA is the only biopolymer that is completely natural. There's nothing else like it. It is going to be the backbone of the future. Another Danimer PHA really is the only marine soil, industrial, and home degradable product out there that can be made at commercial volumes, i.e. can be made at scale. So 
is you know you're, you're seeing potentially a lot of demand some really big names and that's that's a big deal when you're thinking about custom uh, about a company like hey does this company actually have traction but is this market forces at work or something else at play and the reality is that a lot of this is actually driven by green initiatives and nothing wrong with green initiatives. I'm all for it, having a sustainable environment, but you can see it's it's being driven by like PepsiCo has an aim to design 100% of packaging to be recyclable, um, compostable, compositable, compostable, or biodegradable by, by 2025. You can see each of these brands are saying like, hey, zero net emissions by 20. 50 or McDonald's aims to have 100% of its guest packaging come from renewable, recycled, or certified sources by 2025. Each of these companies recognize it is a problem to have all of their byproducts sort of end up in landfill. It's not a long term solution. Let's have something that works over time. And there's also some great founda foundations that are sort of pushing either countries or companies to adapt these standards for a better future. But what about the underlying economics? Because at the end of the day, you need to have price demand, you know, that that's actually, you know, supply demand that's actually going to drive these initiatives, you know, over time. What about the economics of using PHA? And unfortunately, if you look at PHA versus traditional plastic costs or PET costs, that PET, by the way, that's that's an even trickier name than, than what PHA is. Um, unfortunately, PHA is order of magnitudes greater in terms of cost than, than what is everyday plastic cost, where the PET cost, which is plastic, is measured in pennies, like 10 cents per pound or 20 cents per pound. PHA is measured in dollars. And that's that's where we are right now. Um, so in order to get sort of market acceptance, sort of the penetration of PHA in the years ahead, you're going to need one, the goodwill or, or the publicity of some of these mega corporations like PepsiCo saying, hey, we're, we're doing this green initiative and, you know, we're willing to pay more for our packaging. Um, the challenge here is that, you know, the, they, they're going to try to pass that on to consumers and then consumers might say, well, do I really want to pay up for that? So there's, there's that aspect. You're going to definitely need legislation at the end of the day that's going to push it saying, hey, any new packaging has to be made with these types of materials with these types of biopolymers so that we're not filling the landfills, we're not choking out the turtles. Um, and three, you know, the implementation globally will be extremely challenging to do because it's much easier for richer countries to sort of shoulder the cost, say, hey, PepsiCo, you know, you're going to do this or we can afford to have, you know, an, an extra premium on the cost of having those, you know, uh, potato chip bags or a bottle of water. Um, whereas in some of the more developing countries, it's going to be hard to say, hey, yeah, I know this costs you pennies and let's let's raise it multiples higher um, in terms of, you know, creating this biodegradable product. And also another big aspect is you're going to need to have time where over time, if you have more and more players enter the field, this is the same thing that happens with semiconductors. As more and more players enter the field, as time progresses, as, as things improve, you have lower and lower costs people find more uses of, of using a given product. Um, okay, so it, it may not have the underlying economics right now, but what about Danimer's potential in actually the immediate term, in the next few years, uh, the medium term? Um, and so first, like you should understand that there's just huge demand for this. This isn't just a few couple of big companies. Like 80% of these water bottles or plastics ever generated end up in landfill or nature. That's a huge problem with only 10% ending up recycling, 10% incinerated. And you know the addressable plastics market, you're talking about hundreds of billions of pounds generated each year of plastic waste that could be eliminated by Danimer over time as they get scale. You know, they talk about 800 billion pounds of plastic produced annually. The, the, the important conclusion is that this opportunity of, of sort of cleaning the environment by having better plastics sort of in the ecosystem is measured in the hundreds of billions of pounds. Um, so if if they don't get this whole market, this 800 billion, if you just capture a, a, a percentage of the forward thinking companies um, that say, hey, this is how we're gonna do it, even if it means slightly higher costs, and we're gonna somehow figure out a way to make it work, um, that could still potentially be a big market because you're, you're talking about a slice in an 800 billion 
pound market um you know that that's looking at where it is now could it could it be dramatically could it capture a much bigger slice of that 800 pounds in the future absolutely but that would require legislation and time so what's this spell out for danimer and management is like whoa we are gonna be great we're we're at like 50 million in revenue now and in the future we're gonna be at 500 million in five years time 2020 to 2025 and you can see that you know it's worth calling out they have effectively three separate segments traditionally they've they've most of their business right now is from pla resins that actually doesn't exactly have to do with what they're doing or with what they aim to do with pha um pla resins it's like a way of of making things more biodegradable, but it still doesn't meet the, the marine standard. So you can put on this PLA resin or put on a coating on, for example, a, a cup, and maybe it's maybe now you can recycle it versus what you were previously using where it just ended up in a, in a landfill. Their focus on it is, hey, let's focus on making this PHA resin, this 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 uh, chemical over time, and that's going to be the the main driver of our business over time. And you can see that's the dark green, you know, bars here, and that's that's really what they're aiming. It's it's de minimis in 2020, but in the future, it's going to be the vast majority, and that's where they're going to be investing most of their time and resources. And in which case, they think their EBITDA margin is going to be over 30 percent. This is going to be really profitable business. But in order to have confidence that they will deliver on these figures, you need to size up a few different things. Like first, you need to think like, hey, do you actually have an unrivaled value proposition? And like, while I've talked sort of high level about demand, in the actual side, like, do you have any orders? Has there been any indication of orders? Like going from 60% growth to 130% growth next year, 65%, 40%, you know, seeing that sort of growth in the years ahead, um, where it's literally 10x in five years, you need to have real orders in place. And they're actually all booked up through 2022, which is pretty incredible. So they have this, this plant in Kentucky where they're saying they are fully sold out of Kentucky's capacity from overwhelming customer demand, 48 million pounds. And this, this includes multiple phases of expanding the Kentucky plant, um, where you can see there's phase one, there's phase two, and then there's Greenfield where they make a whole new plant somewhere. And so by 2024, they're saying, hey, we can go from 48 million pounds of capacity. And keep in mind, I'm talking in millions of pounds in a market that is billions, hundreds of billions. So it's a very tiny sliver of what is a much bigger market. And they expect to be sold out through 2024. So 2022 is sold out. Um, and you know, they, they're saying this is based on their the relationships they have where if they're able to produce it, and that's that's the comment, like if they're able to get their factory up and running, there is contracts in place to sell it. Um, and they think they can get, you know, if if they can get to 154 million pounds of production by 2024, they think they're gonna get sold out there as well just based on indications of interest from their existing customers. So not even not even looking at um, new, new potential customers. So that's a big deal. Um, and also what they call out, they're mostly using take or pay contracts, which is very nice. Like take or pay contracts, you're, you're saying, hey, you're going to do this deal that we signed up for. And if you don't, like, hey, you recognize that plastic costs are much cheaper in the future, like, you're still gonna have to pay us. There's still gonna be some sort of fee that you're gonna have to pay us. So take or pay means that they're the, the these companies like PepsiCo are effectively locking this in, that they want this business. Now it really comes down to Danimer, like can they deliver? We'll get up more onto that in a second. But like, who are the types of companies signing up? You can see WinCup, where they recently signed a two-year contract with $14 million to produce plastics to convert into straws as part of the fade straw line to be sold in Walmart and large scale trials at national and international quick service restaurants and retailers. And you can see that represents 10 million pounds. When you're when you're looking at this, like that is just one line of straws that WinCup is looking to sell. That's 10 million pounds out of 50 million capacity. So you can understand like 800 billion market versus, you know, hundreds of billions market versus very, very tiny supply, you know, like what, what they're just sort of scaling up right now. Also, they have a large consumer products brand. 
I, I wonder if this is Pepsi or, or maybe Coke, where they have a joint agreement to develop biodegradable film resins for this consumer products uh, brand, uh, global food and beverage business. Sounds like Pepsi. Um, what about an unrivaled value proposition? And this is actually where it gets interesting, um, where they call out, hey, here's all these potential competitors that have tried to produce PHA. And by and large, like, we're, we're number one, um, where, you know, like we, we, we are at 10 kilotons of capacity, um, which is dramatically more than all these other companies. Most of these other companies, like they, they either don't have real commercial capacity or they have phantom capacity or they're not even able to provide samples. Um, so like this suggests that right now they are in the lead. They are the pioneer in the PHA industry, which is great to see and very exciting. The reality is, though, is that it's very, very early days. You know, Danimer in 2020, so I assume this is estimating by 2020 year end, is that they're looking at 2 million pounds of annual capacity um, versus an industry measured in hundreds of billions. So that's like, it's, it's worthwhile to understand this is just super early days. This can evolve dramatically differently in the years of head. And keep in mind, once you get something that scales, if you have that formula of like, hey, this is how we're gonna produce it, maybe all it takes is just more capital to say, hey, we're gonna go build three more factories. And you know, this this kilotons go to, you know, um, it goes to something crazy, like um, hundreds of millions of pounds or billions of pounds of production. Um, so as an investor, what exactly are you underwriting with this? Because like I, I just showed you that they have, you know, that they're the number one player in this new field. Um, they have these these take or pay contracts with some of these incredible companies. Management's forecasting, you know, a 10x improvement in the next five years. How many companies can can pencil something like that out? Um, this like a lot of investors are like, hey, risk free money. Like this sounds great. So as an investor, what exactly are you underwriting? And I'd say you're actually underwriting a lot of potential risks. Like for example, here's their Kentucky factory or their facility, and they're going from 2 million pounds to 65 million pounds in the next five years. And that's great. Like I, I think it's awesome that they think they can do that, but you're effectively as a shareholder in Danimer, you are underwriting a 30X increase in five years. And you know, like the reason why this gives me a little bit of pause is I did some investment banking work several years ago for a large uh, engineering and construction company that nearly went bankrupt when they were trying to build some alternative energy plants to go from sort of the trial to commercial phase um, or trial or small, small batch to much larger batch. And the problem is there are unexpected problems. That's that's the reality when you, when you go from when you when you're trying to do 30x in just a few years and so this seeing that sort of gives me pause I mean with great risk potentially great reward but that is something that you need to think about like the risk is scale like can this thing scale 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 um like that's that's a big it's it's cool to see that they 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 have the first commercial batch at two million pounds a year but you know, can this get to 65 million pounds? Can this get to 150? You know, that that sort of growth in the years ahead. Uh, what's the next thing? Margins, you know, management saying, look, we think we're going to be at 30% EBITDA margins. If you look at some of the classic sort of chemical companies, uh, their, their profit margins are much, much lower. And part of this reflects an early industry where you're still in the take or pay contract phase versus just selling a commodity because there's 10 other players that can manufacture the good. Here it is, you have Danimer and we're like, hey, we're number one, we're the only one that can sell it in size, we're getting these special deals. So maybe you can lock in this 30% you know, EBITDA margins over time. But the reality is like currently they're at 4% EBITDA margins. You're, you're sort of making a bet like, hey, I think you're gonna be able to get scale. Um, but recognize that longer term, like getting that scale is going to be for a window. Longer term, generally commodities, uh, do get much lower margins. And so the question is, how long does this sort of stay in a window where you're you're able to get these special margins, you know, 30% margins? Are, will they even be able to? Um, will they be able to scale and get the cost structure right? You know, for example, 
if they're using canola oil, you know, have they locked in their canola oil costs? What happens if canola oil, you know, prices jump dramatically? You know, those sorts of questions, because that that sort of does affect what what whether or not you can hit 30 percent, you know, plus operating margins or EBITDA margins in the future. Um, what's another risk? Another big risk that I, I feel like it's it's not properly understood is cash burn, um, because the reality is they are looking to spend hundreds of millions of dollars in expanding their capacity in the years ahead. And that is the right thing to do if management truly believes like, hey, we've got this revolutionary product. All we need to do is invest in expanding our capacity so that way we can meet this need that Pepsi has, that WinCup has. So like it is the right thing to do. Let's see them execute on that. But you can see it's going to cost them hundreds of millions of dollars, you know, over a hundred million dollars just to expand their current Kentucky plant, you know, getting this phase two plant, adding their capacity, and then several hundred million dollars just to do a whole new plant in the future. Um, I It bothers me, you know, the bottom left, it shows what their net income and EBITDA is. They don't have another line which shows free cash flow because that's really like what you should be, that's something you definitely should be considering. And the, the cash flow in this case would be, you know, EBITDA less um, CapEx, and that would be a proxy for what what, what your cash flow is. Um, and you know the reality is they're going to be hugely cash flow negative or cash burn the next few years. Like if you're 2022 and you're saying your net income is 28 million, well, yeah, that's great that you have 28 million in net income, but that doesn't factor in that you're going to spend over 200 million dollars on you know effectively new new capacity. So you're going to be cash burned to the tune of closer to 200 million dollars than you are going to be positive. So that's that's just the reality. This also like. Ah, this also explains why they're doing this as a SPAC deal versus, let's say, doing debt financing or something like that. Um, and you could see the deal, the SPAC deal, and this is going to the terms, is that you're 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 getting 200 million from the Live Oak acquisition plus a private placement. So other investors say, hey, we'll commit another 200 million. So around 400 million dollars, of which the vast majority is going to the balance sheet of Danimer so that way they can fund this cash you know this cash burn in the years ahead so if they're going to burn through a few hundred million in the next few years and they have limited collateral you know they did a sale lease back on their Kentucky plan um so that means if they have limited collateral they have limited borrowing capacity they need like what financing are you going to use it makes sense for them to do an equity raise which is what they're doing with this SPAC, where it's permanent capital that they're raising. They don't have to worry about interest rates or or do they have to pay back a loan in the future. Um, that said, you know, management often talks like, hey, we think this is actually going to be really cheap. It's a cheap deal, but you know, look at three times EV to EBITDA. Um, that this might be getting a little too technical, but enterprise EV stands for enterprise value, and that is it nets out, removes the cash that they're raising. And, and so it says like, hey, we have a billion dollar market cap. Let's remove nearly 400 million in cash. And wow, isn't this cheap? It's 600 million value of this business. But the reality is that that cash you really shouldn't be subtracting because in the next few years, they're going to burn through a lot of it. So I, I would really focus on like, hey, what's what's the total value versus what's your cash flow potential? We'll get to that in a second. Any other risks? And long term, I definitely think there are some risks. And let me let me just give an example. And let, let, this is commentary from management. So these, this is management's words, sort of reading between the lines and why this is important to you. So this is the commentary from the Live Oak management. First and foremost, we believe PHA is the best end of life solution for plastics. All right, we've sort of covered that already. One of our consultants, McKinsey, commented early on that PHA is the best end of life answer for single use plastics in particular, as there are no other marine degradable materials available with the proper performance characteristics. Now, what's really important to call out here is notice what they're not saying. They're not saying our branded Nodex PHA is going to be the best end of life solution. What they're saying is that PHA is the best. PHA, not what we custom, this this special product that we're bringing to market. And what makes me nervous about thinking about this is that it, it reflects that one day, well, right now, most of these companies don't have capacity. Most of these companies aren't producing it at scale. But one day, one of their competitors 
might unlock the way to produce this in scale and might also start producing PHA in mass quantities. And like, for example, what if you have corporate espionage or someone, you know, someone starts seeing one country sees, hey, they're being really successful with this. Let's let's figure out a way to hack into it, steal that information. And now, you know, maybe we have a government loan to build out hundreds of millions of pounds of capacity. Just throwing out one one crazy scenario, not not that crazy based on real life examples. Um, so how much, you know, and, and when you think about that, you know, how much money will will these competitors throw at production? You know, that's so it's it's a concern that longer term this will turn into a commodity, just like everyday plastics are treated like a commodity, where it's based on a price of pennies on the pound. Right now, this is dollars on the pound because this is a very this is a very new industry. And it's great. I'm really glad that really glad that this industry is developing. It's better for the world, but recognize how things evolve over time. What are my thoughts on all this? So when I look at the valuation, you know, I'm 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 thinking like, hmm, right now it's around a billion dollar market cap, excluding the cash for the reasons I already mentioned, you know, which is that for the most part, they're expected to burn through most of it in the years ahead. And you can see, you know, management's penciling out around 50 million in revenue for 2020. So that's that's what I'm layering in, which is pretty sizable growth of of around around 60% growth for 2020. Now, my first of all, this, this is my value proposition to you, is I provide these sheets you know, for you to play with. And you can put in your own assumptions on what you think, how this plays out over time. If you go to the description of this video, you click on the link, you download it, then you can play around with it yourself. Um, but you, you have to try to download it first. So this is, this is hypothetical. Like you put in your own assumptions, could this go significantly higher? Absolutely. Could this go significantly lower? Yeah, probably too, true as well. Um, and, and just sort of high level, my upside case seems to be in line with management's projection, whereas my low case is really meant as sort of a throwaway where I'm assuming like, hey, there's a problem with scaling production. And I've called out a few different things. Or within a few, few years, you know, competitors figure out how to mass produce PHA and investors start valuing this company more like a mature chemical company with much lower margins versus the startup that has great growth potential. And so, you know, like going through those different scenarios, like in the downside case, I'm saying like closer to 10% optimized margins. And you can see some of the major chemical producers have long-term margins closer to that. And keep in mind, their margins currently aren't anywhere near here. They're, they're currently single digits. Um, Whereas the upside case is closer to like 25% opera, uh, you know, op optimized margins or operating profit. You know, they they target 30%, you know, so that I, I'm, I'm penciling out 25 to factor in like the cost of factories um, and depreciation. And so then like, what's your growth rate in the years ahead? Once again, the high side, this gets to the 500 million in revenue. That's based on sort of what management was targeting. That implies nearly a 58% Kager revenue growth annually, annually compounding at that rate, which is incredible. Um, and you can see, you know, the 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 range of valuations of of ten to twenty times um, for for what you know this this could be in the years ahead. And you know, if if you're looking at ten times on the low side, like this is this is meant as like, hey, people are valuing this more as a commodity, and you effectively lose a lot. Whereas on the high side, like maybe you get 90% upside. Um, that's, this This doesn't strike me. This, like this doesn't have the wah, wah, wee, wah, super exciting. Um, this is this is more like, you know, it's, I'm excited that this, that they're making this bet and that they're, they're doing this. Um, but the risk reward, I don't find to be super compelling looking at this. Um, and you can see in my base case, I've even, I've even, you know, goofed up a little bit where my growth rate is probably way too high because it's even higher than the high side. So in the sheet, I'll, I'll lower that to like 40% annualized or, or lower. The real point here is in, in the base case, I was showing what, what a range of multiples would look like for this business, because the reality is like, I, it, it's hard for me to underwrite saying 50 times earnings multiple in five years from now you know, maybe 20 times, you know, keep in mind their, their growth rate in 2025 based on management's projections is something like 13% growth. 
And part of that is just filling up capacity because then they're going to have to build a new factory, you know, to, hey, only only after we build a new factory can we, you know, sell, increase increase our sales. Um, so this is, this, is, this is an example where I'm not in love with the risk reward, but I really think what they're doing is super interesting, super compelling. That said, if you want to see what I am personally buying, what are the companies with an unrivaled value proposition or, or companies that I think have a really strong value proposition um, that have, I believe, an attractive risk reward where it's limited downside, much, much higher upside, um, go to unrivaledinvesting.com, click on Journey. I also make exclusive content just for Journey subscribers and Journey subscribers get to help me direct where we go on this journey. They help direct like, hey, I want Live Oak. And so that's what we did. Um, and the reality is finding just one potential multi-bagger can change your personal life journey. So if you're interested in following my journey, this isn't one day, one week. This is a multi-month, multi-year process. This is the journey to find these multi-baggers. Multi -baggers. Go to unrivaledinvesting.com. Click on journey. If you enjoyed this video, please make a point of subscribing and hit that like button. And thank you so much for watching.